<laughs> I, I, I wasn't yeah. sure if we are supposed to come to the interview or not. No, of course you're supposed to come but, up and at any time you are welcome to, to chip in, ask a question, uh, input a comment. Um, uh, it's, it's all part of the conversation really that we're having with Mariette. Um, it's been recorded and it will be available on YouTube. Uh, for uh, We put it up tomorrow and people can watch it. Later on, we'll edit it, edit it and, uh, and make it really more professional. Um, I can just... Thank you. As a quick introduction, I want to uh, yeah, just first welcome and thank you for here's somebody else that I quickly want to just uh, add into the room. Uh, welcome uh, to Sibongile, who is also going to be our next guest on Wednesday evening. Uh, Sibongile will be our guest and we'll talk about impacts of timber plantations. Um, so tonight, Mariette, uh, Mariette Liefering, Federation for a Sustainable Environment, I thank you very much for agreeing to be a, a guest on this uh, a small platform. Our intention is to conduct several interviews with several uh, uh, people, role players in the environmental, water, forestry sector. Um, and really to examine some of the of the of the problems, so of course mining as well, to examine some of the problems, uh, to look maybe a little bit more in depth into some aspects of it, and then really to look at what the civil society are doing and role players and organisations and networks. What are people actually doing on a ground level to counter uh, uh, this massive environmental threat? And then um, what works and what doesn't work, you know, and what should we as activists or what should civil society um, activists in the environmental sector, how do we, we approach this problem in a way that can actually bring about some form of positive change? Um, so it's part of a, of a program that's uh, a, a small little project that's funded by the uh, Global Green Grants uh, Fund. Um, so it's, it's, it's part of that uh, project and the report, I think the report should be interesting. We did a community conservation resilience initiative quite recently where we went into deep rural areas and, and spoke to the deep rural communities directly asking the same kinds of questions. What are the main problems in your area? How are you responding to it? What are people doing How You know, be it... Uh, lobbying government, be it fixing the road or cleaning the river, you know, physical actions. Um, and then, and then, of course, to, to, to devise some kind of, of strategy, um, uh, uh, you know, best practice for going forward. So it's really an honor for me to, because most of the people that I, that I interview, I, I know, um, and it's, that's, I really feel thankful for the fact that I've, I've gotten to know so many good activists um, around the world, really, because it will not be restricted to South Africa. We've got, uh, uh, well, let me first say, our first guest was Mr. December Ndlovu, who is from the Bushpark Ridge area, um, uh, environmental activist in the forestry and water sector. Then we spoke to Mr. Brian Ash, who is the current chairperson of the Timberwatch Coalition mostly about uh, timber plantations and the way that they affect uh, KwaZulu-Natal. We spoke to Mr. Dale McKinley, who, uh, Dr. Dale McKinley, who is a, a, a social and political activist, if you will, um, well written. And uh, we had quite an interesting discussion on, on the whole COVID crisis, um, as I'm sure we'll also touch on with the uh, interview with Mariette. Um, then we spoke to Mr. Matthews Glaban, who's from the Witbank area, of course, involved in the mining, in the struggles against mining. Also, I've known him for, for since 2003, when we first worked together on the project. Um, yeah, tonight it, 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 it's, it's Mariette, and on Wednesday it is Sibongile, on Sunday it is David van Wijk, the next, next Sunday, David van Wijk, who's uh, with Bench, Benchmarks Foundation. And then the next Wednesday... Um, it will be a guy called Oliver Munyan, who's from the Global uh, Forest Coalition, um, and he's their main plantations campaigner. So that, you know, I think all of these interviews are 
with interesting people about interesting topics, about vital topics to discuss. We need to have these discussions. Mariette, in preparing for this, I was uh, just looking at some of the stuff online and we once uh, recorded a, a, a presentation that you delivered at a Geosphere event way back during the COP, I think it was 2016 or, um, and then, but it's there with your slides, with the PowerPoint presentation and it's, it's such a valuable resource. And it's really a pity that it's, that it's, you know, not that well promoted, you know, it should be many more people should be watching these. And I'm sure your movie, Josie Gold, which we'll talk about shortly, um, of course, that all helps to raise this kind of awareness. Um, but yeah, it also helps to, to put, blow some life into our small little organization, Geosphere, um, and it, it, it keeps us relevant, I think. So, Mariette, um, I just want to quickly explain the, the format, and I just want to allow an extra person into the room. Um, we're going to, I first I want to talk a little bit about, or I want to hear a little bit about, I want, don't want to talk, I want to listen uh, uh, about your experiences, where you grew up, where you were born, where you went to school, and really I want to come around to what inspired you to become the ace activist that you are. Um, and then and then later on we'll 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 talk about the issues that you face on on unfortunately on such a regular basis. Um, and then solutions and if anybody at any time want to speak up you are welcome. There's not a lot of people in the in the room. Um, so it, it it won't be a problematic if you have a question or if you have a comment and of course, I'll also periodically ask for people if they want to, to ask or, or submit something. So Mariette, again, thank you for appearing on tonight's webinar. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself or as much as you want about yourself, where you were born, how you grew up? Thank you very much. First, I just want to welcome Simon <laughs> Hi, hi, Mariette. This is me in in real life, not in a picture thing. So oh, okay. uh, let me remove the glasses at least. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> this is me. Uh, so hi to everyone. Hi, Sibongile. Thank you. Who else is here? Um, Mariette, are you there? Oh, my microphone has been muted. Sorry. Hi, um, I'm Robert. Hey, Rob. That's nice you. Like yeah, you. I'm sorry. I'm a bit in the dark here, but I'm looking forward to, to the discussion and, and hearing what you guys have to say. Great. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Right, Mariette, I think the floor is yours. If you feel that, uh, that, uh, that because sometimes you break up a little bit, uh, let me just, uh, oh, it's broke up a lot because Mariette was gone for a bit. Mariette, you're back. You're back, Mariette. Um, so I, I do apologize. I, I do not know why I have some uh, internet connection problems because usually I am quite stable with the internet connections. Um, so, uh, Philip, first, I think, refactory to, well, what we are going to discuss, I just wish to also laud and salute you for the, uh, your courageous activism and sustained activism over many years. So, while you very graciously invite us to these interviews, I think that your activism has inspired many of us to continue with our activism. <laughs> oh, wow. So, Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll sh uh, share my video. Um, so what I wanted to uh, discuss, perhaps my background, uh, my father was a senior magistrate and also um, uh, on occasion uh, a judge. He served as, uh, as a judge as well. My mother was a teacher. And I think my father instilled in us a very strong sense of justice. Uh, when I was a teenager, my, both my parents were 
irreligious and my father was an atheist. So during my teenage years, I think I rebelled against that and I became a member of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think Jehovah's Witnesses are known to be very controversial <laughs> and very much opposed against the state. And so I think that gave me the courage to speak out against what is the established norm or what is the status quo. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses also do training uh, in public speaking, so I'm thankful for that. However, um, uh, well, after 30 years of serving as a missionary and also as an ordained minister, I lost my faith. Um, uh, I, I would not say I'm an atheist, but I, uh, I have some doubts. Uh, perhaps I should classify myself as an agnostic. Uh, because I have some concerns regarding the fact that there is so much suffering, so much poverty, so much injustice uh, in our world, and, and that causes me significant concern. And I think that is what also motivated me when I no longer was involved with Jehovah's Witnesses to then find a new purpose, a, a new uh, calling, so to speak, and uh, this calling was now um, to, to pursue uh, environmental and social justice, because I think environmental issues and social justice issues cannot be uh, separated. They are uh, basically the same. So uh, in 2007, um, uh, the uh, organization, the F Federation for the Sustainable Environment was uh, uh, formed. And one of the founder members, with George Bezos. And I think I just want to read a small uh, extract from the Sunday Independent, which reported on the for, for, uh, found a formation of the Federation for the Sustainable Environment. Uh, it reported the government and mining houses face a major challenge and the strong likelihood of legal action from a powerful new conservation alliance about to be formed by an array of environmental bodies that are concerned about the way precious parts of the natural environment are being destroyed. Renowned human rights lawyer George Bijos has pledged his support in his capacity as consultant to the Legal Resource Center. I am heartened at this point to mention that this um, relationship, notwithstanding the tragic passing away of advocate George Bezos, had continued for now more than 14 years, and the Legal Resource Center are still our attorneys on a record, besides the Center of Environmental Rights, and the dedicated service of the Legal Resource Center, that is Mr. Lucian Limasher, and also now, and their team, on behalf of the FEC is now establishing important legal precedents and also affecting um, some policy and uh, uh, regulation changes, that is in environmental law changes. I can perhaps uh, detail it more or discuss it in more uh, detail if there is perhaps an interest in that. So uh, I also just want to refer to the objectives of the memo uh, of the uh, the FSE, that is in terms of our memorandum of incorporation, I'll briefly refer to it. These objectives are beside promoting the ecological sustainability of development and the wise use of, wise use of natural resources in Southern Africa. The objectives also include protecting and promoting environmental health and functional ecosystems for future generations ensuring that the development involving the consumptive or destructive use of natural resources specifically benefit local residents and parties affected by the development and ensuring that the total cost of the use of natural resources, including all externalized and long-term costs of maintaining ecosystems services to local people are provided for and borne by the project, facilitating the mediation of existing environmental degradation and so forth. So, perhaps, before I continue, perhaps if uh, um, 
Uh, uh, Philip, you want to perhaps interpose and ask um, some questions? Yeah, I just want to, uh, I, I remember because we, our organization was also at, I don't know if it was the very first meeting, but so, uh, it was somewhere there in the, in the, in the, in the RAN. And um, um, yeah, it was, a, uh, I, 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 um, I think it was your activism, you know, your, but before before I get I get really to how the FSC uh, function, um, I I would like to know a little bit more about how you started pulling it together. How did you how did you where did you get the, the contacts to be able to reach out? How did you go about that process of establishing this uh, network or this coalition or federation? Yes, so my in my interest in environmental activism started with narrow self-interest. Uh, a mining, uh, uh, um, a petrol and oil company, that is Royal Dutch Shell, um, it was desirous to develop a um, showcase, a, a flagship petrol station, a highway petrol station opposite my home in Bryanston. And at that stage, uh, I opposed the, the development, not only because of the impact on my own property, but the impact on uh, schools in the area and also on my neighbours and also in adjacent um, uh, residents. Uh, in time, of course, um, I think we are all uh, familiar with that objectives fatigue developing. In other words, um, people become tired of, of opposing a development, and in the end, it was only, well, myself. So Royal Dutch Shell Group then decided to target me. <clears throat> they then offered some benefits. They offered, for example, to pay for my family and myself for, an, uh, for a holiday Cape Town when we were to meet uh, Sir Mark, Mark Moody Stewart. He was the then chairperson of Royal Dutch Shell Group. And I accepted the invitation on the proviso that they also invite the thousands of other residents that would be affected by the development. Of course, that is not logistically possible. No. And so they then proposed that they would come to me and they, then they would make a proposal. The proposal was that they would then push these highway petrol stations onto my neighbours. They would then build a I wall around my property, develop the, uh, the adjacent properties so that it could benefit my family. Uh, the properties would be developed into a, sw into a swimming pool for my family, a tennis court, a squash court, terrace gardens, and so forth. And of course, I then alleged uh, in terms of section 31 of the National Environmental Management Act that this was bribery and that they were not allowed to bribe a, a whistleblower. And so I reported them to the Gauteng Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. Then they lapsed into silence. And then I was requested to present <coughs> at the preamble to the um, sustainable development. Uh, it was in 2020, the, uh, the World Sustainable, sustainable development, development Conference. Correct, yes. And I was to present on Shell as a case study. And that night, they came to my house and they withdrew their entire application. It must have cost them hundreds of millions of rand because they have bought out 23 properties wow. in Bryanston, which is, of course, a, a, a fairly large properties. They did honour their promise. They never did develop. The, the petrol stations, they only developed residential properties. I nonetheless did present my paper at the, uh, at the preamble to the, the Sustainable Development Conference, but the news media seemed to have taken an interest in this matter because it was this old woman, um, really a very ordinary uh, a person, who has now been successful against a multinational oil company. At that stage, possibly the biggest oil company in the world. And, uh, and I think it gave me a, a sense of grandiosity. I, I felt that, well, um, if I can make a difference, one person, perhaps I can make differences in other aspects as well. So uh, I felt 
very much empowered and encouraged by that. Right. And it was as a result of the public media coverage that I was then approached by 53 landowners who owned one of the richest, in fact, not one, the richest gold and uranium, uh, well, their land was where the richest gold and uranium mine company operated. That was gold fields at the time. It was 53 landowners, but because of the mining activities, they could no longer irrigate. They could not use the water because the um, underground aquifers or compartments had been dewatered. The land also was polluted with tailing storage facilities, and they then required me to act on their behalf, and I was successful in that they were then, uh, well, they, they, they were paid out by Goldfields, not a substantial amount, but they were paid out. And, and well, that is when I then became aware of the legacy of gold mining, not just the, the, the mining activities of Goldfields, but 120 years, mining activities by 130 mining companies and the impacts of the, the gold mining and uranium mining on our water resources, on the soil, on the, the human rights of uh, adjacent or host communities, uh, the dust fallout, for example, the acid mine drainage and the long-term impacts, not just for current generations, but also future generations, as well as uranium, radioactivity, sinkhole formations, subsidence, ground movement, and so forth. Yeah, no, it's a terrible uh, legacy that's been left by the by the mining industry. And you now, maybe before we continue, uh, uh, can you reflect a little bit about our society's need for a mining industry? I mean, it seems as if people have been mining for uh, um, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. You know, um, and can we can can we break that dependence? Um, I know that there's things like the gold, you know, which is a, a, a which we don't really need uh, that much of. And I mean, uh, uranium, of course, being used in, in power. And that's another question that I have for you: Why why is the uranium not used? Why is it why is it just being left in the in the in the tailing stumps? Um, but yeah, perhaps you can respond yes. to that. These are very valid and uh, relevant questions. First of all, Philip, with regards to mining, I, I just want to make this statement. There is a proverb that says that ignorance is bold and knowledge is reserved. So over more than now 15 to 20 years of activism, I think I have become more reserved. <laughs> I'm not as bold because I have now become aware of the the, the needs of uh, uh, mining affected communities, many of these communities characterized by widespread poverty. Their interest is in jobs, um, social upliftment. So my um, objective, as is the objectives of the FSE, is therefore also to empower communities, not only to look at short-term benefits, but also to look to medium and long-term benefits uh, because often the inter- and intragenerational equity uh, does not uh, resonate with uh, 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 communities that are poor. So we focus very much too on the closure and the sustainable future land use and livelihood opportunities of mining affected communities. Because as we all know that mining by its very definition is unsustainable because it depletes a non-renewable resource. So there ought to be then from commencement of mining or even prospecting already um, uh, future land use objectives uh, and there be concurrent rehabilitation in order to achieve these objectives so that when mine closure um, uh, is implemented that the communities have alternative skills and alternative livelihood opportunities. In South Africa, it is regrettable that there is not just a dependency on mining, a, a physical dependency on mining, but also a psychological dependency on mining. 
Even uh, uh, old President Nelson Mandela referred to mining as the backbone of our country. Uh, so while the FSE is not opposed to mining, we, we do um, promote and uh, we, our active, act, uh, uh, activism is based on responsible mining. That is the internalization of externalities, that there ought to be sufficient financial provision, not just for current impacts, but also for latent or residual impacts, and that would include also the pumping and the treatment of extraneous or polluted water, which may continue for hundreds of years. I now refer to specifically acid mine drainage, of course, uh, we find within the coal mining industry and also the gold mining industry because of the sulfide bearing rock. So um, uh, we work very closely with mining communities. We also have entered into memorandum of understanding with some of the mining companies in order to find win-win solutions for both the mining company and also communities to capacitate communities that they can meaningfully and intelligently participate in, um, uh, uh, in um, uh, these processes. And uh, but now with regards to the, the current situation within the gold fields, I'm now I'm not referring to sand mining or platinum mining or you or uh, coal mining, and we are very involved in that as well, as well as diamond mining. But with it to the gold mining, because it is a sunset industry and the closure of gold mines is a given, currently there is a significant uh, activities pertaining to the reclamation of historic or existing tailing storage facilities. Currently, only the gold is recovered. And to refer to your question, why is the uranium not recovered? Uh, the tailing storage facilities, there are 270 mine dumps or tailing storage facilities. There are also 380 radioactive mine residue areas. And there are 600,000 tons currently in the tailing storage facilities, that is 600,000 tons uranium. In uh, its low grade uranium in the tailing storage facilities. Uh, the principal radiological concern is, is the inhalation and the ingestion of radioactive dust from these tailing storage facilities. And Mubani can perhaps also contribute to this because she's done a number of research studies in this regard. The other principal pathway is, of course, an authorized entry onto these tailing storage facilities, the use of uh, radioactive tailings for construction material and the deposition of the, the, the dust on agricultural crops. Yeah. So the reason why mining companies are currently not uh, um, uh, reclaiming the residual uranium is because the price of uranium is too low. Nice. They cannot justify the economic viability uh, of the reclamation of uranium. So when they reclaim now the residual gold, the residue containing uraniferous waste is now being deposited on regional tailing storage facilities, uh, which we do not oppose because these regional tailing st storage facilities then consolidate the waste and these uh, newly constructed tiling storage facilities are better engineered. Often they are also lined, which prevent the seepage or the pollution of metals, including uranium, into the groundwater. Uh, so these are some of the um, activities that are currently being pursued. So um, how, how many of these, of these tailing dumps are actually lined, the storage facilities? You say not all of them. Uh, the the historic tailing storage facilities, not one, has been lined. And historically, these tailing storage facilities have often been placed in wetlands or in very close proximity to river systems. Mm. This was to allow for the, um, the drying out of the, the tailings. Uh, and that, of course, was the, the worst in, uh, environmental option to pursue. So that is why many of the 
the streams, the rivulets, the rivers downstream, the wetlands downstream of carrying storage facilities now contain elevated levels of metals, wide spectrum of metals, including uranium in the sediment. The regional wind storage facilities now, in terms of the new regulations by the Department of Water and Sanitation, must be lined. And I can here refer to Sabania Stillwater, uh, who is currently doing extensive reclamation operations. Their tailing storage facilities in the Fockville area uh, were uh, authorised with, with the uh, provision that it has to be lined. So th they cannot proceed for the deposition of 1.3 billion tonnes of residue uh, unless they line the tailing storage facility. This is, of course, not a foolproof method because in time, uh, PVC linings may be pierced or disintegrate. Or even if you use bentonite clay, clay, there may be cracks. Mm -hmm. But at least at this time, uh, it is considered to be the best practicable environmental option. Uh, Anglo Gold Shanty, who has sold its uh, South operations to Harmony Gold, their expansion of their career run regional tiling storage facilities, uh, um, there is also the um, the um, regulation that they should line the ex expansion of the uh, the tailing storage facility. But I mean, it, it's still even if it's lined, it's still basically it's uh, you know uh, just shifting the the problem for future generations. So my question is, how long will this stuff actually be toxic and and poisonous and radioactive? How long can it be left in you know in in some facility? before it becomes benign? Well, the half-life of uranium <laughs> is 10 to the power of eight years or 10 to the power of 10 years, which would mean that it will remain a radioactive for geological ages, not just radiological and not just a biological ages. Beside the fact that uh, it will remain radioactive for um, uh, billions, millions of years. Uh, uranium, of course, has decay products. These decay products have short uh, uh, lifespan. I wonder, um, uh, Philip, I see Mbali has her hand up. Perhaps we can give her an opportunity. Yes, please. I'm sorry, Mbali, I didn't see that well. So thanks a lot for the pointing that out, um, Mariette. Please, Mbali, if you have a question or a comment. I have a question also. Um, while on the subject of, you know, you, you asked a, a very good question of for how long will we have this problem? Um, I just have a question, Mariette. What is the response in, for from the mining companies, especially your DRDs, your anglers, um, in terms of supporting projects that come and ask for funding uh, when it comes to to projects like manufacturing, you mentioned bricks, um, and also the tiles that you can manufacture from from the tailings because of their high silica content. So, what has been, you know, the response in terms of funding such projects? Uh, thank you, Mabali. I think it's a very valid question. As you know, we have raised this issue with uh, uh, Sabanya still water, and it seems that there is an appetite for that. It, it would appear that they want to diversify, um, uh, you know, the use of the residue uh, uh, in different beneficiation projects. So I think there is an appetite for that, but I think we will have to pursue that appetite. As you may know, Bali, um, uh, Professor Elise van Eden also proposed um, uh, um, uh, an alternative future land use in the sense of um, um, uh, 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 tourism, a research hub, uh, ecotourism, adventure tourism, and so forth. It has taken uh, some <laughs> diligence and some tenacity, but uh, I am heartened to say that the project is going to, to proceed. Uh, uh, Professor Elise van Eden has just received confirmation of funding. And uh, I know that you are part of that research team. So at least that is a positive. So let us hope also with regards to the use of the residue for construction material, 
that that also will be pursued. So uh, if I may encourage you to please uh, continue to, to raise that issue and on behalf of the FSE, I shall also continue to raise that issue. Um, uh, thanks, Mbou, um, for the question. Now, just come... Yep, Con please continue, Maria. Yeah, so just to continue with regards to the uranium, um, um, uh, it has DK products. These DK products have shorter half-lives, but they are higher in radioactivity. And here I refer to radium-226, uh, also, of course, radon. It's a, a gas that has an extremely short half-life, but it's widely accepted that radon causes lung cancers amongst uranium mine workers. There are other type products of uranium as well. And as we know, acid mine drainage also contains, besides a wide spectrum of metals, it also contains uranium. So these mine uh, tailing storage facilities cannot be maintained in a reducing or oxygen-free environment. Uh, whenever it runs, whenever the tailings are exposed to oxy oxygen, it then would obviously uh, result in acid mine drainage. The acid mine drainage in turn will mobilize and solubilize metals, including uranium. So the, the challenge here is the long-term management and mitigation of these risks. These risks cannot be eliminated. Many of these historic tailing storage facilities because of their steep gradients cannot have successful vegetation. It also, there will be um, most of the time because of the steep slopes, uh, dust fall out. And uh, so what is required, therefore, if you can, of course, not eliminate the risks or the impacts, you have to mitigate or manage. That is in terms of the National Environmental Management Act and, and the National Water Act. I just wish to interpose here that in terms of both the National Water Act and the National Environmental Management Act, it recommends that reasonable measures must be implemented to mitigate and to manage. But the definition for reasonable is not given, but we would infer that reasonable would at least mean that the risks to communities would at least be minimized if, not, if it cannot be uh, eliminated. Thanks, Mariette. Um, I know that you conduct these um, toxic tours, and it'd be really um, interesting if you could just give us a short description as to what that entails. What do you take people to see on these tours that, that you conduct? Yes, uh, uh, where we stop first is within uh, the West Rand Goldfields, which of course has a, a, a hundred or more years of, of gold mining and uranium mining. Now, um, we, that is the FSE, has been given a court order which allows us access to the properties. These properties belong to Mintails and it belongs to Westwood's Monarch. Now, Mintels, and here I just want to mention that it is important to see why closure of a mining company is much more preferable to liquidation or abandonment of mining operations. Mintels operated since 2006. Uh, it did not have a rehabilitation funds. It was in 2018, it was liquidated. But Mintels has a group of companies. So it had a, a parent company that was Mintels Limited, which, is a, which was registered in Australia on the Australian Stock Exchange. Then it had many subsidiaries. So what happened is that often there is a gap between governments. We call it a governance gap. You have a, a mining company, the parent company, which controls the company and profits flow to this parent company, while the subsidiaries often um, carry the liabilities. And this is what happened when Mintels, um, some of the subsidiaries went into liquidation. It left um, open pits, it left 
toxic and radioactive dams. It left unrehabilitated footprints. Mintos only mined the profitable parts of the tailing storage facilities. There is no access control, no mitigation measures, no management measures in very close proximity to communities. And um, uh, it also was responsible for the treatment uh, or partial treatment of the acid mine water. So Mintos then went into liquidation with an unfunded environmental liability of 460 million rand. The impacts are currently carried by the local communities, by financially beleaguered local municipalities, by the state, by future generations, and by a mute environment and neighboring mines. So the first part of my tour would be to show the legacy and the irresponsible mining practices of the Mintos group of companies. We have had a successful court order so, um, uh, um, uh, as I've mentioned, part of that successful court order was to allow us access to the properties of Mintel. So, I take um, groups, uh, it's not just local um, uh, uh, interested parties. I have done these tours with uh, quite prestigious international academic organizations, with the World Health Organizations, with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on uh, Human Rights, on on uh, with UNEP, with uh, with um, with many universities, overseas universities, news media. I've uh, I've also done the tours with government officials. I've done the tour with uh, communities, of course. I've done the tour with other nonprofit organisations. In fact, in the last five or six years, I must have done the tour with more than fifty thousand people. Oh. Uh, I evidence of that because uh, uh, the participants must complete uh, uh, an indemnity form. So <laughs> if I'm called to account, at least I can produce the evidence then. After we've done the tour of the Mintos operations, we visit uh, open pits 30 to 40 meters deep where there is now significant uh, illegal mining activities. We, we visit the toxic uh, and a radioactive Tudor Dam, where the radioactivity is significantly elevated above regulatory limits. We visit the toxic Tudor uh, uh, Lancaster Dam. We visit some of the tailing storage facilities of Mintos. We visit the North Sands Dump, where there is also uh, uh, significant illegal mining activities. And then we go on to Sabania Still Waters. Uh, Rand, Rand Fontaine operations. There we are allowed by Sabania. They are very transparent and very accessible. They've allowed us to visit their reclamation operations, massive reclamation operations of, um, of um, uh, Sandam 20. Uh, sorry, the other uh, name of uh, Mintos was North Sands, not Sandam 20. And then we visit also the acid mine drainage treatment plant within the Western Basin and downstream of the acid mine water treatment plant. We also visit the mill site uh, uh, reclamation operations. We see how the hydraulic mining is being conducted. We then visit, um, if time allows, we visit the South Deep Mine of, um, uh, south, uh, of uh, Goldfields where we can see how a newly constructed tailing storage facility uh, uh, is being developed. In other words, it's the genesis, it's the birth of a tailing storage facility. We are often also um, showing how the gold pouring takes place, how uh, a significant amounts of a gold bearing rock are being then uh, um, um, smelt, uh, smelted. And the, that thing produces <laughs> this small gold bar, which of course is worth quite a significant amount of money. So uh, that is usually what the gold in, in times. And tell me, Mariet, uh, you are full time busy with your work for the FSE. Um, and how is that supported? Because it must uh, take. Yes, uh, uh, Please continue. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, on work full time, <laughs> also on weekends, because I, I enjoy my work and communities, of course, uh, I think that they also have 
a specific need. So I do spend most of my time in engaging with communities. I also do research on behalf of the FSE. We also uh, assist other uh, researchers. Uh, we publish um, uh, academic reports. We also present at uh, universities uh, as guest lecturers, as associate researchers. Uh, so our functions are uh, many. We also engage in social program programs for mining affected communities. These are host communities as well as environmental lectures and also envi uh, 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 environmental workshops. Now, our funding um, is limited in comparison to other NGOs. Our funding is um, very modest. Um, I think most of the NGOs will agree with me that the funding is often for charismatic animal and plant species, while for the non, for the more, um, what is the word, brown issues, the, the, the unpalatable issues, <laughs> the funding is often not forthcoming. So we are also involved in litigation. We, uh, um, uh, we also comment on significant number of applications. We also bring appeals and so forth. And of course, uh, that funding is required for that. So some of the work is done for us pro bono, like the, the Center of Environmental Rights, the Legal Resource Center, Sometimes universities also do work for us pro bono. We also have a, 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 a I have a bucky <laughs> because I need a bucky for the mind dumps, and that is being sponsored by Acme Graphics. We also do receive funding from some of the mining companies uh, to do social programs uh, and to assist communities um, uh, with, with information so that they can participate in a meaningful manner. These um, uh, MOUs uh, do not fetter the FSE. The, uh, the MOUs allow for the FSE even to litigate. So there is no compromise whatsoever. No. Uh, we are all funded by the legacy group of hotels. And I may just mention all my co-directors, including um, Bali Mapanza. <laughs> they contribute their time, their advice, their no. knowledge, it is totally free of charge, yeah. uh, although I receive a, a salary. No, it is just amazing uh, what what uh, your organisation and your federation have been been able to achieve. I want to uh, want to ask you, please, to reflect a little bit um, on the movie Josie Gold, how that came about, uh, and and what can we expect when we watch it, and 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 how did it change FSC's uh, profile? <laughs> yes, uh, it was an interesting exercise. Um, um, uh, you may know Nosewick, and the editor of Nosewick is Martin Wells, and his son, Adam Wells, is a scientist, but he also is a, is a journalist. So uh, when acid mine drainage became a very, um, well, a, a public issue, he then engaged with me and he asked me, if you could photograph the tours that I do, the engagements that I've con that I have conducted, and uh, and I agreed to that, but there was not really any funding for for the documentary film. But he followed me, and I think he followed me for ten or more years. And I thought this film will never see the light because there is just no funding. And one day, he uh, he did receive a funding from uh, from Norway and from Sweden. They had an interest in this Josie Gold, but they wanted the, <laughs> the Josie Gold to be a bit sensational. So they wanted to focus on my high heels, my red nails, <laughs> my, my red lipstick, because they felt that that was unusual for an activist to, to wear high heels <laughs> on my knees. So while it was embarrassing for me, because it did, did focus on the more eccentric aspect of my life because uh, I, I don't think I'm quite the, the, um, the, the usual activist, but it also focused on the fact that I'm just an ordinary person, yeah. that I didn't have a special training as an activist or even as a scientist. And that um, is Sylvia Wollenwerfen, she is professor, Professor Sylvia Wollenwerfen and a very renowned uh, journalist, 
she she then uh, um, uh, promoted the film and with Sweden, uh, the, the, uh, the funding came from Sweden. It had the support of the Swedish ambassador, in fact, from a number of embassies of the Nordic countries. And then uh, they then became very much more focused. And um, did it, did it, you found that it, that, it, that it helped you in your work? Has it? Has very it much. Okay. Yeah, very much so because it was shown internationally. It received many awards. It is an acclaimed documentary film. So it is not, it was not just shown at Cinema Nouveau in Rosebank and at the, uh, in, in Cape Town at a prominent theatre. It was shown internationally. It had its uh, previews in Sweden, in Norway, in many countries, and it opened up many. So, yeah. It opened up many opportunities uh, uh, for us uh, to be, be, be more uh, recognized internationally. For example, I was recently asked to speak at the Basel Gold Day in Switzerland at the Basel University. And the theme of the conference was how to obtain clean gold. And I think that was as a direct result of the Josie Gold documentary film. When did that happen? It happened, I'll tell you now, um, it was, I think, a few months ago. It was in 2002. Uh, it, uh, it's part of our uh, annual report, which is on our website. Okay. Because in the annual report, it, uh, that, that Basel Gold Day is being featured. But that was not the only. There were many, many other academic uh, conferences where um, the he was featured, and I think uh, because we must just remember the Josie Gold uh, 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 film is about the FSE. I, I may perhaps be the, the physical, uh, what is it? Uh, um, face of the, yeah. face of the FSE, but it is about the FSE. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I look forward to seeing it. I didn't, um, when you sent me the email, I didn't receive the link, so I'd, be, I'd appreciate if you can send me the link to the movie. I posted the yeah. link to the trailer, which I like, and then uh, I'll post it when I post a YouTube video, I'll just uh, post it post it in the, in the commentary. Um, I, no, uh, sorry, uh, Philip, I just want to mention, I did send it to you, but it was an attachment to an email. In the email, Professor Sylvia Wollenwerfen did give the, the link and the password to the okay. form, but I just have to explain that it is a commercial form. I do not have the prerogative to okay. distribute it because uh, I did not fund it. My organization did not fund it. I didn't direct it. I didn't solicit it. So, so it's, the, not, it's not like available on YouTube or, or something like that. No, it is a commercial form. Okay. Now that's a pity because I think it is something that people should have have, have kind of access to, you know. Um, I want to, to quickly touch on those main things that you spoke about in terms of the impacts of, 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 of minds. And I want to specifically uh, ask you just to, to quickly explain uh, asset mind drainage, um, what, what the cause is, what the impact is, and then maybe if you can refer to the Robinson Dam and the Twekopi Sprite and also some of the impacts on the peoples um, due, to, due to AMD. Yes. Uh, so uh, acid mine drainage is recognized as perhaps the most costly socioeconomic and environmental impact. Um, uh, acid mine drainage is formed because of the oxidization of uh, peritic material, uh, we find that uh, gold mines and coal mines contain iron pyrite. The iron pyrite in combination with water, rainwater and oxygen can produce acid mine water. Now what happened in the gold fields is in the 1960s, the apartheid government allowed for the dewatering of the mining compartments uh, in order for mining to be conducted safely. But as mining uh, ceased, uh, the mining company stopped pumping the water from the underground mining compartments, 
and so then the pre-mining flow patterns and volumes of water were restored. But this water that now ingressed into these dewatered mining compartments combined with the disturbed rock, the disturbed rock contained iron, contained, uh, iron pyrite, and this pyritic material then acidified the water. The acid water then also leached the other metals from the rock, which includes cobalt, copper, zinc, arsenic, uranium, arsenic is a metalloid, and, uh, and then in time, this underground basin rewatered. It filled up with this water, but now highly contaminated water with uh, metals in toxic concentrations. And in some cases, then it started to decant or to flow on surface. The first basin, which was, was fully flooded where decant occurred, was in the Western Basin. Uh, currently, 30 to 40 million liters of acid mine water is being pumped because the, uh, to prevent uncontrolled rewatering or decant. When the uh, acid mine water started to flow into the river systems, into rivulets and into dams, it resulted in significant pollution. Uh, it had devastating consequences. The downstream Twi'alupi Sprite is still, uh, since 2002, when acid mine water started to decay, it is still a highly, uh, a, an acute toxic area. Uh, all aquatic biota have been wiped out. That is still the condition in the upper Tuilupi Sprite. As an emergency measure, the um, government decided that acid mine water must be pumped into a recreational dam. That was the Robinson Lake. The Robinson Lake, when acid mine water was discharged, that was in 2002, then resulted in the Robinson Lake becoming a radioactive, a declared radioactive dam. It had uranium levels of 16 milligrams per liter, which is 40,000 times higher than uranium levels in natural water. It is still, it's now a desiccated dam, but it is still a declared radioactive dam. So this is the impact of acid mine water. Uh, the current treatment of acid mine water is by means of neutralization, which means it's a pH adjustment. Lime is added. The lime then increases the pH. At different pH levels, different metals drop out, like manganese, aluminium, cobalt, copper, and so forth. These metals then be change into a different oxidization state. Instead of being soluble, it becomes solid. And this solid sludge is then discharged currently in the Western Basin into an unlined pit. In the Eastern Basin, it is uh, discharged into, uh, uh, onto a tailing storage facility. Uh, no, sorry, in the Central Basin, in a tailing storage facility. And in the Eastern Basin, it is being discharged into boreholes. So this is unsustainable because these metals can again be mobilized if the water becomes acidic. We also do not know what is the impact on downstream water users because there has been no environmental impact assessment done. Besides that, the salinity in this neutralized acid mine water still renders the water unfit for any use because the salinity levels, the sulfate levels, are between 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams per liter and the resource quality objectives are 600 milligrams per liter. So that in a long term, it has significant risks for our uh, uh, Vaal River system. Sure. Um, can I ask, in your experience and with your expertise, um, if you had unlimited or access to unlimited resources, what, how, do, how can this be fixed? How can this be mitigated? AMD specifically, okay. like the Twee Kopi Spread, how can you rehabilitate that river to a, 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 a appropriate standard? How can you get life well, back first into of the river? Yeah. First of all, of course, the treatment of acid mine drainage uh, must not be short-term treatment. It must also include desalination. Uh, if the uh, environment is very resilient in time, uh, an environment can restore itself and wetlands. But I think, Philip, for me, the, the, the principal concern 
the crux of the matter is that our Department of Water and Sanitation must be capacitated. I sit on the Water Sector Leadership Group, Sustainable Development Dow Six Task Team. It's the highest body. It is addressing uh, the gaps in uh, the Sustainable Development Dow Six targets because we have to achieve drinking water for all, safe drinking water for all by 2030. We've uh, signed onto the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, I'm referring to Sustainable Development Goal 6. Now, I just want to refer to the water situation in South Africa. 56% uh, uh, of our wastewater treatment plants are in a very poor condition or dysfunctional. 50% of our wetlands have been destroyed. The remaining uh, wetlands, 33 percent of work condition. Most of our principal river systems are now beyond recovery. In fact, uh, it's a state of uh, disintegration has accelerated since 2011 to 500 percent. I've also been part of the advisory committee of the South African Human Rights Commission on a number of issues, and I now would love to refer to the AMD uh, advisory committee, as well as the recent inquiry of the Human Rights Commission in the sewage pollution of the VAR. The Human Rights Commission found that the VAR is in fact so polluted that it's beyond recovery. It's a principal water resource. It provides water to 19 million people. They use the water for drinking, economic purposes, and uh, irrigation and so forth. And I, if I just may, I did not uh, really prepare to talk about it, but I just want to mention to you what the report from the Human Rights Commission found. It found that um, the, the, it's not just the municipality that caused the sewage pollution over many, many years, but it says that the Department of Water and Sanitation had not been able to hold the municipalities accountable and concluded that there were extensive non-compliance at all spheres of government. It also mentions that um, the Department of Water and Sanitation must develop and implement policies to deal with the water crisis in South Africa. You see, we have many excellent policies, regulations, uh, acts of parliament, the, the problem is just that we are weak in implementation. We cannot drink plans. We cannot drink policies. We cannot drink regulations. So besides that, the uh, Department of Water and Sanitation has a financial uh, shortfall of 333 billion rand for the next 10 years. There are lack of skills. There are lack of political will. There is political interference. So with the asset mine drainage, it was proposed that asset mine drainage had to be desalinated by 2014 to 2015 in order to address the water scarcity within the integrated VAR river system. It has now been delayed possibly indefinitely. The Lesotho Highlands Phase 2 had to come online in 2020. It has now been delayed to 2027. So all of these issues, I think, is really the crux of the matter. Uh, so there has to be cooperation, too, between Department of Mineral Resources, Department of Water and Sanitation, because at the moment, the Department of Mineral Resources are authorizing mining activities, skull mining activities in protected areas, in areas of strategic water resource importance. So all of these things, I think, are major, major challenges. Yeah, sure. Um, at this stage, I just want to ask if there's anybody that, that wants to comment. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and just ask, uh, ask Mariette a question if there is any question at this stage? Um, mind if I go ahead? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Maria, that, that's been very, very interesting. And um, I mean, it's in one of the sectors that has such a large impact. And historically, I think mining in general, but gold mining especially, has had such a big environmental and social impact on South Africa. Um, wherever there's gold to be mined, it seems people want to be mining. Um, my question to you is how do you keep um, mining companies accountable? Because I mean, they are probably 
hundreds of, if not thousands of different operations all over the place. So how do you, how do you attempt to, because like you said, the legislation in South Africa is great and it, technically it should be up to the departments to, to do that, but it seems like your organization, you know, takes a stance from, from the NGO side, but yeah, so how do you keep them accountable? And the other question is, is there a way that mining companies I don't want to say mine sustainably, but mine responsibly, um, I guess, economically viable to them. Like, is there a model where if there's enough uh, authority and, and uh, where they follow regulations, where it actually makes sense to mine? Yes, and that's that. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good questions. <laughs> With regards to how do we hold mining companies um, accountable, uh, we, of, we of course have uh, the provision of Section 31 of the NEMA, where it states that if we perceive an environmental risk, um, we can then whistleblow. Uh, to the news media. Uh, we've often made use of the news media. The news media gives us a public voice. Um, so to one or more of the news media, we can whistleblow it to the public protector, to the Human Rights Commission, to the parliamentary portfolio committees, uh, to the director generals or to the ministers for that matter. And these are all avenues that we do pursue. We, of course, in good faith uh, and in well courtesy, first engage with a mining company, we alert them to um, the, the regulations, the applicable regulations or the applicable laws. Uh, we often refer, of course, to the National Water Act, but uh, that is section 19, and the, uh, the NEMA, that is section uh, 28, where there is a duty of care on a mining company to prevent pollution. Uh, uh, if then there is no action taken, no mitigation, uh, measures, then we do escalate the matter. And uh, we've had success. Uh, I, um, I, I must say, uh, I, I can uh, cite many examples. Uh, one example that I just want to mention that really shows how it can influence policy or regulations is with a mental matter where we have litigated, but not only litigated, there was extensive news media coverage on the delinquency of the or the alleged delinquency of the directors and also the pollution and the ecological degradation uh, caused by mentors. As a result, uh, the, uh, the, the draft regulations for financial provisioning, that is by the Department of Environmental Affairs, now include in the duty of care not only the directors or a company. They now also include the liquidators and the business rescue practitioners. They too now are being uh, held responsible and liable for uh, uh, environmental degradation, pollution, and also foreclosure. This is as a direct result of what happened to Mental. So uh, uh, it just shows that perhaps there's no silver bullet, but in time, they, they are definitely positive changes. And that uh, I can mention is a positive change because um, the liquidated <coughs> or liquidators or business rescue practitioners in the past were not held accountable or liable for any pollution caused by a mining company. So that I think was very positive. If you, your second question, uh, if you can just remind me, please. With regards to can a mine mine responsibly and sustainably and economically? Well, um, um, and no mine can mine sustainably because it depletes a non-renewable resource. Uh, however, as we know in Section 24 of our Constitution, there has to be justifiable economic development and there has to be sustainable ecological development. So we cannot prevent mining because there has to be that balance between ecological sustainability, but any mine must be economically justifiable, which would mean that when they do their due diligence, they must make provision for their latent and residual impacts. These impacts include, for example, acid mine water, radioactivity, dust fallout, 
uh, 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 seismicity sinkholes formation. So there ought to be significant um, uh, financial provisions to make the, the mining responsibly. And while mining, they must do concurrent or progressive rehabilitation. Furthermore, mining affected communities, host communities must benefit from mining. They are being called upon to carry the risks and the impacts, and therefore they must be made provision uh, for certain beneficiation of these communities. I just wish to here mention that unfortunately, most of the local municipalities are bankrupt. So often mining affected communities conflate the role of the municipality with the role of a, of a mining company. So in many cases, mining companies have almost taken over the functions of municipalities, which is really, uh, it's not a good reflection on our municipalities. Sure. I hope it answered. I think that was quite a comprehensive answer. Um, Robbie, if you have any anything to add to that, or anybody else for that matter, before we continue? Um, I just I just want to say thank you. And, and I guess to add, um, made it pretty clear that, that the municipalities are struggling currently. Um, do you think there's a place maybe even to, to the responsibility, responsibility falls on the mining companies now um, in a lot of these cases? Um, but yes, no, that answered my questions perfectly. Thank you. And I just uh, perhaps also make a statement. Uh, it has been found by Professor Anagon and uh, Kneen. I, I do not know what is his title. They've done a recent report on uh, how often um, informal settlements and, set and even uh, formal, informal and formal settlements are, are moving closer to mine tailing storage facilities and also to mining companies. We see often informal settlements developing on the foot, uh, footstep, of, right, on the footprint, not footprints, uh, uh, on, uh, on the doorstep of some of the mining companies. And unfortunately, that then also exposes those communities to mining related risks, especially dust fallout and polluted water. Uh, currently, uh, it is estimated that 400,000 people are living on uh, these radioactive of mine residue areas. So uh, the, uh, these issues are complex because while the mining companies uh, have uh, certain responsibilities and liabilities, uh, sometimes the, uh, the authorization of uh, settlements uh, in close proximity to uh, tailing storage facilities or mining operations exacerbate the risks to communities. Um, some years ago, I, I, I read or heard about uh, two rhinos having been poached uh, close to Kruger's door um, in itself a uh, tragedy. But um, then I also heard that both those rhinos were blind, apparently due to the water that they've been drinking that's contaminated by uh, uh, these elements that you spoke of. I want to know if you, if, you, if you are aware of that incident. Is that possible? Do animals, people go blind due to this uh, kind of contamination? And um, has there been uh, ever conducted the comprehensive health studies um, to see really what, to really quantify the costs of mining on our society? Okay, first of all, uh, it was two hippos. Uh, the hippos live in the hippo dam. The hippo dam is the first dam that received Asset mine drainage, first the raw AMD from 2002 to 2012, and since 2012, the neutralized AMD. So it's still very high in acidity. If you visit the Hippo Dam, it is red in color because of the high iron. Uh, the Hippo Dam is within the Krugersdorf Game Reserve. Uh, there was um, uh, allegations that they may be blind. But they, they have, they, that was never determined because the, the, it's two old hippo bulls and it was considered too risky for them uh, to, to be captured. So the, the hippos are still in the dam. Uh, they do not eat uh, any vegetation in the dam. They, they graze outside the dam area and there is another dam 
which they frequent. So the, the, there's never been a study done on the on the hippos. But obviously the, the, the water is unfit for any aquatic biota because there is no aquatic biota within the upper water from tanks. But I may mention here that my daughter, Simone Lieferant, is an aquatic specialist and a biodiversity specialist. And that, in fact, is the area of her research. Uh, she works for Sabanya Stillwater. She is their uh, water and biodiversity expert. So she has um, more than sufficient data regarding that. But I mean, it is a common cause. It's an established fact that that water has resulted in um, uh, the um, in wiping out most of the aquatic biota. So th that is with regards to that. It is also a tragedy that the that the game reserve should be the receiver. receiver of acid mine water or neutralized acid mine water. And that I think is, is totally unacceptable. Uh, furthermore, that water of course flows further down into the Blaubank Sprite, eventually into the Crocodile West. So it also flows through the cradle of human kind world heritage site. Then to coming back to the impacts of acid mine water or radioactivity for the matter there is, an abundance of anecdotal evidence of asthma, of pulmonary diseases, of leukemias, um, uh, of many uh, ailments. However, there has never been an epidemiological study done in order to determine the, um, whether there is a causal link between the anecdotal evidences. There's also allegations of cerebral palsy and also mining waste. That is a significant uh, uh, gap. Uh, so uh, the World Health Organization with Professor Vinder of the Northwest University contacted the, the, the FSC, my organization, and asked us to, um, uh, to collect 1,600 samples of human hair. Uh, human hair, as well as teeth and nails, um, a, a bioaccumulate metal. So the hair was to be tested for uranium. Unfortunately, the study was inconclusive. It could not conclude whether there was elevated levels in the uranium. We collected the hair from people that live in close proximity to tailing storage facilities within the West Rand, Soweto, and the Far West Rand. Uh, however, it is uh, widely accepted that acid mine water, the chronic exposure, to the drinking of acid mine water may result in imp impairment of cognitive function, skin lesions. It can result in cancers. It can also affect the neural development of the fetus. Uh, it, it can also result on, uh, in non-adaptive diarrhea because of the high salinity. So uh, these are facts, uh, uh, but as I've mentioned, there has been no epidemiological study conducted. Uh, the silicosis case, as you know, where uh, the mines have agreed to, to compensate the silicosis victims, I can just mention to you that involved thousands and thousands of documents and many, many years of, of um, research. Uh, the Legal Resource Center was involved with that, as well as Richard Spool. Yeah. Sure. Now, um, so, Mariette, I heard you say that uh, that closure of mines is is I mean we there's some mining activity that 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 has to stop because uh, I mean like Gandhi said the, the the earth can provide for everybody's need but not for everybody's greed and obviously there are sectors <laughs> there are sectors of our society and and that that cannot do without if you think about transport for example um, if you think about you know if we want to uh, develop uh, some some better rail uh, train transport, uh, you know, to get the trucks off the road, and you know, we we we're going to still be dependent on mining for a long time to come. Um, but I think the mining can be much less, especially if we if we only look at our own needs as a country. Um, I've heard from Matthew Schlabani, for example, that around eighty percent of the coal and the best grade coal is being exported to fulfill the needs of, of more developed countries in the north. So that international global link that seems to tie us down to this model of development is still very much at play. 
Um, can you just uh, quickly reflect on that? Our global links with uh, big mining houses internationally and then big markets internationally? Yes, uh, I think perhaps just before I answer Simbongile, had her hand up perhaps. Simbongile, please, yeah, yeah, please ask a question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Marit, uh, for this sheesh. For me, some of the things I knew, uh, so I've learned a lot, especially when it comes to sustainable mining. I've never heard of that, or maybe because I didn't want to hear anything about that because I thought mining is, you know, but I think the reality is that we're going to have mining in one way or the other, um, you know, especially because we are still this developing country and everything like that. But also I, I'm, I'm thinking what really sustains you, you know, in this journey? Um, and is it not dangerous? Because here I, I hear you, you, you deal with so many uh, powerful uh, people. And in this country, we, we know that if you are saying something different, you can be silenced in one way or the other. How do you sustain yourself in this journey? Um, and also amongst the people that you work with, are there any people that um, are, are um, what, what's the word? Your succession, you know, are there people that are really going to grab this and go with it any other time? Thank you. Thank you very much, Imbogele. Just to answer the last part of your question first, uh, we do a lot of skills development. We really try to empower the youth, we really try with the, the workshops that we conduct, the lectures, the tours, to also uh, assist other communities. We also, although our funding is modest, we also do provide financial support to some of the community members, because I must just mention to you, uh, poverty is a reality. And even to, to have access to data, to be able to participate in Microsoft team meetings or Zoom meetings, virtual meetings, is almost impossible if you don't have data. So, so we often assist these communities. We also expose them to other projects, to other research groups. Uh, so we definitely are planning for, for because I'm almost 70. <laughs> so perhaps uh, within the next 10 years, I will no longer be. So it's important, I think, but there are many, many excellent Nonprofit organizations with wonderful activists, which I am very sure will do a much greater uh, job than I can do and will be much more successful. Uh, I, I also know um, I have very great admiration for organizations such as, for example, um, the Center of Environmental Rights, a public law firm, which are currently involved in very, very um, uh, cumbersome burden some litigation, uh, their, their labor is really, uh, I can only salute them. So uh, there are many that, that can uh, do much better than my organization can. Uh, but in, uh, your first question, how do I sustain and uh, uh, keep, uh, keep sustaining? I may mention of my background as a witness. I, uh, as a Jehovah's Witness, I, uh, I was trained to, to take blows. I was trained for 30 years to be obnoxious, to be looked down upon, to be discriminated. You must remember Jehovah's Witnesses were not part of the apartheid system. We were in prison. So during those years uh, uh, before our democracy, uh, my family members were imprisoned. Uh, my, uh, uh, we were discriminated against with regards to jobs. My children were, I had four children. My children were expelled from school. So I was used to being disliked. Uh, in other words, to be disliked is not a problem for me. I, I in any case, am not a social person. So I, I don't need, uh, what is it, social support. I, I don't mind being different and being perhaps not liked. <laughs> but with regards to the, um, the dangers, the physical dangers, I must just tell you that there, there are risks even from within. It's not only risks from outside. There are some organizations, also NGOs, that are desirous of funding 
and, and then often there is competition. One must not always romanticize NGOs. NGOs can also be, as politicians, quite competitive. And, and I, I've just recently received quite a strong thing where I was told it's either the bullet or justice. And um, this organization, which is referred to as, um, uh, perhaps I should not mention the organization, but, uh, but they did threaten to, to, to kill us in the shafts, in our homes, on our farms, <laughs> and, and on the streets. And that is not because of, um, that in any way we solicited this antagonism. I think it's just simply there is competition for funding. Mm. So, uh, and then, of course, with the Zama Zamas, I've never encountered aggression, but there are many murders taking place. I was, um, I witnessed eight Zama people being killed. It was a fraction, a fraction of fighting between two different, um, uh, 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 what is it? Um, groups, uh, foreign nationals, foreign nationals. And uh, so we often are aware of, of violence in, 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 uh, amongst the unlawful mining, but we are in support of a regulated artisanal mining because we do feel that it can provide jobs for very poor communities. Yeah. Sure, well, I think Robbie had a, had a question. I, I didn't see it. It's on the chat. Okay. Uh, let, let me just see. Uh, they will. Uh, oh, Bali says, great. Then Simbongeli said, they will do their part, not more than you. You have done enormous. <laughs> That's very kind of you, <laughs> Simbongeli. Very encouraging. You ask, how do I sustain myself? Well, this is what sustains me. <laughs> it's the solidarity and the support from people like you, and especially also now the invitation by Philip to talk <laughs> on this on this platform. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm, 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 I'm happy that, that this uh, kind of thing is part of what sustains you because we need you and uh, people like yourself, like Sibongile, um, to be sustained because uh, we, we need you. Um, I just, uh, we're basically out of time, but I, I had that question about our international links because I think that's part, a big part of the, of the problem, you know, is this global model of development. And I, I take note of the fact that you've been doing international international reach out and um, and but do you have a just a short sentence to say on that? Yeah, it's just that there is of course a great anger and a resentment to the fact that most of our reaches, the resources that belong to the people, our people, that most of those profits and benefits are being exported to other countries. So what we are left with are often the impacts and the risks, the pollution and the degradation, while the benefits are being enjoyed by overseas shareholders. That, that I think, is, is unfair, inequitable, and unjust. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And we can see it with the, you know, the timber plant, industrial timber plantations um, as well, you know, where most of the or a lot of the resources are being exported to fulfill the needs in, in, in or the perceived needs in other areas, whereas here we are paying the, the costs. Um, I want to just ask if there's anybody else that wants to just quickly unmute themselves and, 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 and a comment or contribute. Um, i just give a moment. If not, Mariette, yo, this was such a pleasure talking to you. I, I really appreciate your time on a Sunday evening. I can see that this job for you is, is never ending, but it's also not a, it's not like a, a job because you, you have a passion for it. And I thank you for that. I thank all of the participants in this meeting tonight. And um, yeah, you must have a nice evening. And again, thank you very much. We'll put this up on YouTube. So tomorrow evening, you should be able to watch it on YouTube. Thank you very much. And I also just thank everyone and Philip for inviting me. Uh, Bali, thank you. You always, you're my best supporter. <laughs> thank you very much. Simbongele, Robbie, and Simon, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, to all the participants, thanks a lot. Simbongele, you want to say something?
Um, I think, uh, um, sorry about that. No. Uh, I think uh, on behalf of, you know, many activism, uh, sorry, activists, especially in my area, I think they would really like to see this uh, on YouTube because I think uh, they're going to be learning so much, so much from your work. Some people have checked with them. Some have heard about you. Some went to Google and Google you uh, before, you know, for me coming here. So I think uh, the recording will be very helpful to share with the young people that we work with because sometimes they ask uh, themselves, you know, how do you go along with this kind of work? Because it's so tiring. So they must hear from other people who are not tired yet and who still see the light. And to say, and I like what you said, to say it's either the, the bullet or justice. I've never heard it being said it in that way. And I think I, I'm taking that forward. And um, it, it, it's making me not to be tired because there are many times I'm tired, but I think that's not no longer a, a, um, an option. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, uh, Sibongile. And we look forward to seeing you um, on Wednesday and having this uh, similar kind of conversation with you on Wednesday. So, okay. and thanks a lot for agreeing to it. So I thank you all. I'll, uh, if you're not on the Geosphere mailing list, just please drop me an email, p.r.owen at icloud.com. I'll make sure that you get future updates because there's going to be some interesting talks coming up. And Mariette, hopefully uh, we can get you back at some stage, have a, 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 some more reflection. And then, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for agreeing to this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, thank you. Good night, everybody.